Soul is the affair of the Lord. وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا خَلِيلًا And mankind has not been given much knowledge of it except but just a little. So with regards to this concept of the ruh, or our own spirit, our nafs, not much is known of it because that is within the domain of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is given to mankind is only a little knowledge, ilm, ilmi illa khalilan. That means just small knowledge with regards to the soul. But there's one thing that we know about the soul. And in Surah Yusuf, Allah says, and I do not blame myself because inna nafsa la ammaratum bisu, because the soul is always inclined towards performing evil deeds. Right? But the caveat we've discussed, so we don't know much about the, about the soul, about the roh, but the roh is inclined towards performing evil deeds. However, illa ma rahima rabbi, except from which those souls which Allah has bestowed mercy. And that's, those are the souls in which will be saved because these are the souls that will not incline towards performing evil deeds but try and strive in the jihad to always perform and be the good and the kind soul that we are meant to be. Right? So this. Important thing is that it is illa ma rahima rabbi. That means that soul that is safe is only through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so today we want to continue from there. We want, I want to start by talking about one of the rules in um, the Forty Rules of Love by Ali Shafa, which I've been quoting quite a bit, in which the author wrote, Real dirt is the one inside, the rest simply washes off. So that means, you know, if there's any dirty on a physical body, it's easy to, to just wash it off with water. But the real dirt, the one that is really important, the one that we need to pay more attention to, is the dirt that is inside our heart. There is only one type of dirt that cannot be cleansed with pure water, and that is a stain of hatred and bigotry contaminating the soul. You can purify your body through abstinence and fasting. That, that means you can try and purify this by regular fasting, not only in the month of Ramadan, but regular uh, Nawafil fasting. But... Only love will purify your heart. Right? Only love will purify your heart. And so this is one of the um, understanding of how we can take over our soul. I mean, we can fast, we can read the Quran, we can, we can pray. And all these are parts of zikr. And all this will be purifying the soul. But the effective way in which we can overcome this is only through love. And so when we look at this, the significance is really quite um, momentous because it only means that in Islam, when you want to talk about a holistic approach towards purification, that the internal purification is connected to the external purification. That if your heart is not clean, or if, if your heart is filled with bigotry or prejudices or you know, a sense of a pride, then no matter how much you try, no matter how much you fast, then it will somehow produce in the way that you speak, in the way that you act. Because what is inside is the content that produces the output that comes out from your mouth, that comes out from your actions, that comes out from even your attitude. Right? So the antidote of this, that it, because these are complementary to each other, right, that therefore the purification must start from the source. And the source is within your heart. So first, it is in the polishing of our hearts. It is an obligation for Muslims then to take care of his soul. And we do this by polishing our heart through constant worship, consciousness and awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second, we always need to be prepared. We need to be conscious of the distractions of shaitan. We need to know his ways. We need to anticipate them and then protect ourselves against it. Yeah, Allah says in Surah Al-Araf, rajim Indeed, those who are God conscious, إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا When an impulse touches them from the shaitan, they will then remember Allah. فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْسِرُونَ And at once, they will then acquire an insight. So, one of the ways that we want to avoid this is to know the distractions of shaitan, to know his ways, to be prepared for it, and then to protect ourselves. And here, in this verse, Allah says, Indeed, if you are God conscious, and this levels, this essence of God consciousness or taqwa is again a similar attribute that is contained within. It's an internal thing. Taqwa is not something that you know you can show off or you can wear on your clothes or in your juba or you know or the tasbih. Taqwa is a sense of constant consciousness that you are always in a state of remembrance of Allah that this, this in your mind and then through that remembrance it gives you protection and guidance because then you are guided what to do even though sometimes you do not know exactly at that point of time the sharia or the ruling for it and that's the importance of zikrullah 
And so when an impulse touches you from the shaitan, so in this case Allah says when shaitan then tries to distract you or try to, in, to, to, to input some form of doubt or was was within you, and they will automatically go back to tadakaru, they will remember Allah, and because of that remembrance, they will at once be given an insight. They will know what to do because Allah guides them through the zikullah. Right? Third, we also need in order to prepare our soul for us to go back home clean and as best as we can, that this internal purification must then manifest through a physical deed, which is our character must then be virtuous. Our success in the hereafter depends upon the purification of our hearts in this life. From spiritual sins such as greed, such as malice, envy, arrogance, and the love for the world. Right? In their place, in all these things that we, you know, we all fall for, right? including myself, we must adorn the heart with spiritual values such as generosity, compassion, mercy, benevolence, humility, and gratitude. Because on the one hand, we can try to purify this heart by trying to perform the dhikr, but on the other hand, it must be supported by active, proactive action by the deeds in itself. So replace those spiritual sins like greed and malice that we spoke about with something more positive that requires an embodiment, which is the physical deeds of generosity, compassion, gratitude, humility. And then, then this will work together with a zikr so that your heart is then polished. And then uh, apart from this polish of the heart, polishing of the heart, your deeds then supplement the spiritual polishing. Right, so purification of the heart is so important that it was one of the first commands which Nabi Musa salam, was given when he was sent to, uh, to Pharaoh, to Fir'aun. And inshallah next Wednesday, we will start with the story of Nabi Musa salam, in which Allah says in Surah An-Naziyat, اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ تَغَى Go to Pharaoh, for verily he is a transgressor. فَقُولْ And then say, حَلَّكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَى Say to him, Will you then purify yourself? And that was the first thing that uh, Nabi Musa was asked when he was asked when he was sent back to uh, to Pharaoh, not to talk about the release of the Israelis, Israel, Israelites. Sorry, not to talk about the retaining of one God, but about the purification of your heart, and that would constitute coming back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and releasing all the ego of having his all the servants around him working for him. That then makes him convinced that he was indeed God, whereas he's just a servant of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay, so first we talk about uh, polishing the heart. Two, we talk about being prepared of shaitan's uh, uh, distractions and knowing and be you know protecting ourselves. Third, we must include ourselves, include in, inculcate within ourselves a virtuous character. And fourth, keeping company of those who are righteous. So Abdullah ibn Rawaha, one of the companions, used to say in a narration narrated by Imam Ahmad, he said, "Come." Let us believe in our Lord for a while. When the Prophet ﷺ heard about him calling to people to, uh, to remembering Allah, then the Prophet said, May Allah have mercy upon Ibn Rawaha, for he loves the gatherings that the angels feel proud to attend. And such gatherings are gatherings of zikr. And it doesn't mean it can be gatherings of knowledge like this, as far as the name of Allah is being mentioned and the remembrance of Allah is being mentioned, that's zikr. It could be a gathering sitting around reading the Quran. It could be sitting around just perform, taking the tasbih and perf- chanting the, you know, the names of Allah. It could be anything of th- any, any deeds that brings you to the remembrance of Allah. That's where angels will come and rush. And this is why the Prophet وسلم, said, May Allah have mercy upon Ibn Rawaha, for he loves the gatherings in which the angels themselves feel proud to attend. Right? So we are heavily influenced by the company we keep. Slowly and imperceptibly to ourselves, though perhaps others might notice more, we adopt the thinking, the habits, the beliefs, the attitude, the mannerisms, and even the lifestyles of those whom we keep, which is our friends. So the Prophet ﷺ in Hadith by at tirmizi said, A man follows the religion of whoever he befriends intimately. That means he follows the religion or the way of life of his friends. So, each one of you should be cautious when choosing your companion. Right? So, in um, in talking about this, in Surah Al-Kafi, the Prof, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Awwadu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim, wasbir nafsaka ma'al ladina yadauna rabbahum bil-ghada, bil-ghadati wal-ashi, yuriduna wajha, 
and keep yourself patient by being with those who call upon their Lord in the morning and in the evening, seeking His countenance or His face or His, his look upon you. Right? وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا and, not, and let not your eyes pass beyond them, desiring the distractions, the adornments of the worldly life. وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ أَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ حَوَى And do not obey one whose heart we have made heedless of our remembrance, and who follows his hawa nafsu, his desire. وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطَى And these are the people whose affair is always in a state of neglect. Okay, so let's look at this verse again. So Allah's advice is, and especially in Surah Al-Kafi, and keep yourself patient by being with those who are always on the path of Allah, remembering Allah, calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both in the morning and in the evening, seeking His countenance, seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that what we do trying to get His pleasure and so that He will have a glance at least, just one small glance. And once Allah glances at our deeds, at ourselves, inshallah, that will be one of our cause for salvation. And let not our eyes pass beyond this sort of opportunity Desiring instead, instead of Allah, the adornments or the attractions of the world. And do not obey one whose heart we have made heedless of our remembrance. I mean, one, those hearts in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them forget about Allah Himself and who only is guided by His hawa or His nafsu or His desires. And whose affair, this is the group of people whose affair is always in a state of neglect. So one other way in which we can help ourselves to purifying our hearts and returning towards Allah in the state of tawab would be a Muslim, and this probably is the fifth tip, the fifth tip. A Muslim may strengthen his soul and connect his heart to Allah constantly by making dua or by making supplications. Because in a hadith related by both Imam Ahmad, Abu Dawud and Timothy, the Prophet said, Verily, your Lord is generous and shy. If his servant raises his hands to him in supplication, in dua, Allah becomes shy to return to them empty. And so, this is the way in which our relationship is built upon Allah. As a servant, as his creation, all we need to do is simply to beg, to ask, because we are totally dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing that we can do without his permission or his will. So even if you think that there's nothing that you need to ask from Allah today, because you are a servant, you raise your hands anyway and ask for something. Minimum, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa qina adab nar." O Allah, make uh, Rabbana atina fi dunya. O Allah, make my life on this earth successful, and also make my life in the hereafter successful, and do not punish me in the hereafter. That minimum. Right? Because that is the task of a creation, that is a work or a job of a servant and the work of the master or the creator is to, to give because you ask. Right? And in this hadith, verily, our Lord is generous and shy. If you raise your hands asking for it with whole sincerity, then Allah becomes shy to return to you while you ask empty. Right? But you know, it's the ironic situation between a servant and a master because consider, how little we do, how little we serve, how little we perform our role as a khalifa, and then we ask so much from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But despite that, right, in a hadith by Ibn Majah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, In the court of Allah, there is no greater thing than our supplication. So keep on doing it, but then make sure over time, as your faith is increased, as your conviction in Allah is increased, then also increase your servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Because making dua eradicate arrogance which emanates from our ego. Because this is the work of a lowly servant who beg, who asks, because we know that we cannot do anything without his permission. So when one beseech Allah, we are affirming our own dependence upon Him and our state of powerlessness. And so this is one of the benefits of making dua. Right? And when we make dua, 
Our dua will either be accepted now, sometimes we make dua and it's immediately and we see it, or maybe later, but remember, whenever we ask to make dua, Allah will give. The time depends on the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He thinks is the most appropriate for us to receive it. Because Jabir narrates this from the Prophet, وسلم, whoever makes dua to Allah, Allah fulfills his needs or in exchange averts misfortune as long as the dua is not related to sins or to breaking of relations. So as long as you don't commit sins, as long as you don't make dua that you know you cut off relations with someone else, whether it's family or friends, then the dua will always reach Allah, but the time and the wisdom of giving it is only in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because another important point about making dua is this the doors of mercy is opened. Abdullah ibn Umar narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith narrated by Tirmidhi, for whoever the door of dua is open, for him the doors of mercy are also open. So ask. So when you ask, you will get benefit of reminding yourself that you are a servant and you need Allah. You ask, you will get the benefit of Allah fulfilling your dua. You ask and Allah will open the doors of mercy to you. And all you need as that servant is simply to raise your hands and ask. Because it is also as an improvement of our condition here in this world by asking for some betterment and also in the hereafter. Right? So someone al Fasi narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu said, Dua turns away, ill destiny and good deeds lengthen age. So whoever desires that Allah answers his du'as in unfavorable and difficult conditions, he should make plentiful du'a in days of ease and comfort. So if you want on that day and you don't know when this will happen, that we need the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should practice and make a connection with Allah on good days because this shows our character. We don't only go to Allah because when we need help. We start inculcating, developing this habit in good peaceful time and we raise our hands and make dua we wake up for tahajjud we do our istikhara we do our hajat even if sometimes you don't feel that we don't need anything because all this are never wasted it goes to a credit in a like bank you know it credits so on the day when you need it because you have been constantly performing this istikhama making dua making for example istikhara or making hajat so when the day when it comes then it becomes easier because all that we are doing right now in good times is to prepare ourselves when we need it during the time when we need it, in the bad times. And we don't know when. So we have to do this regularly now as a way of life, as what we do as servants. Right? So, um, and the Prophet, and we're gonna, we want to end this here. And I know that sometimes you say, you know, well, such, you, I, I make dua, I do all this, but my life is still the same. You must know that Allah listens. And you must, as a Muslim, as a believer, be convinced that he listens and he will grant you. Because the Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, when any one of you makes dua, do not say, O oh Allah, forgive me if you want, have mercy on me if you want, or you know, give me rizki if you wish. Don't do that. Because when you say, O oh Allah, please forgive me, you must be convinced because Allah is Al-Ghafur, that he forgives. And if you need sustenance, O oh Allah, Ya Ar-Razak, Please, you know, I need, you know, for some difficulties Because of his name and you believe in him he, This is what he does, the most sustaining That he will then sustain you and provide for you So the Prophet said, rather you must believe completely That he will do whatever he wishes Nobody can force him You don't have to say if you want to, if you wish No need All this humble, blameworthy modesty is, It doesn't work with Allah And that just reflects the lack of knowledge about his attitude, about his character about his Asma'ul Husna. For example, when you ask for forgiveness, he's Al Ghafur, he's the most forgiving. You know of anyone who's very forgiving, but no one can be the most forgiving like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you ask, Ya Ghafur, I truly regret and repent with all sincerity, you must leave that prayer being convinced that you are forgiven. This is the hope that every believer who truly believes and who knows this is our gift. And so we leave the prayer with a sense of peace, with a sense of comfort, because what we've asked for, Allah grants, because His character of Al-Ghafur Al is in the most absolute terms. 
Whereas as human beings, when we ask for forgiveness and our friends forgive us, they'll say, yes, I forgive, but I'll never forget. If you repeat it again, I'll never forgive you. You know, with all these conditions, Allah forgives completely because He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us and we need Him. So when we ask, do it with knowledge and knowledge tells you because of His absolute Asma'ul Husna, His Natina attributes, that is what He does. And you must take it as He does what He does. And so that is why then we will, live our, we will live our life in a state of peace and comfort because every time the mercy of Allah is shown when we ask for such forgiveness, inshallah, He forgives. So inshallah, um, I will meet you again next Wednesday and we will then uh, continue on our story of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Um, and I wish you a good remaining half of the week, inshallah. Um, may it be smooth and easy for you. We will end this session by reciting Tasbih Kafara and Surah Al Asr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al Asr ila al insan al fi khusr ila al ladina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasa bil haq wa tawasa bil sabr. Sadaq al azim. See you next week on Wednesday, insha Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakatuh.